So we've talked a little bit about the characteristics of Petrarchism, and I've got the list here of characteristics that we talked about. Um, Petrarchism goes hand in hand with the sonnet form that you read about in the Art of Poetry for today. So I want to take just a minute to talk a little bit more about the sonnet as a, a poetic form and the way it works, uh, perhaps go into a little bit more depth than Shira Wolowski did. The sonnet comes to English um, through a poet by the name of Sir Thomas Wyatt. He wrote about a hundred years before Dunn, and he imported this form from the Italian. A lot of his poems are actually translations of Petrarch's work. Um, this is one of his more famous ones. I ask you to read it, and I'm going to kind of work you through it. Before we talk about the poem, though, I want to point out something that I sometimes take for granted that you know, but just in case you don't, the conventions for talking about rhyme. In any poem, the first word that is rhymed is called the A rhyme. We then move to the next one, and if it doesn't rhyme with the A rhyme, we give it a new letter. So this becomes the B rhyme. So hind and more do not rhyme. So hind is the A rhyme, B is more. We get down here, sore actually does rhyme with more, so this is also labeled B. Um, behind, you can see rhymes with hind, so that gets labeled as A. So we can say that this is, begins with an A, B, B, A rhyme scheme, and it, it continues, A, B, B, A. Um, one thing you should keep in mind is that you've got to use a little imagination sometimes, especially if you're dealing with older poetry and English poetry, because English people say things funny sometimes. Um, you know, they've got a different accent than we do, and there's also the issue of things being pronounced differently four or five hundred years ago than they are now. So mind and wind are not words that we typically would rhyme, but clearly given what we know about the sonnet form and the way that these look, it, this is intended to be a rhyme, a rhyme there. So the basic form of the Italian sonnet, and that's what this is, is to have an eight line section that, I'm going to make the font just a tad fall, smaller here so I can write these terms in for you, um, an eight line section that we call the octave. The way to remember that is like octopus has eight arms, so eight lines. Um, this is divided into two quatrains. And you can probably guess from this, the, the, the base part of this word, four. So two four-line sections, each of which is rhymed A, B, B, A, and then another A, B, B, A. That is then followed by what is called the sestet. I'm going to put that in italics simply means a six line section of the poem that finishes it. So you have a total of 14 lines. Within this, poets have a good bit of freedom, but typically the way that this works is that the first quatrain will present a problem, the second quatrain will elaborate on that problem, and then the sestet provides a solution or some kind of resolution to the problem. And this break between the octave and the sestet is called the volta. Literally means the turn. So the turn from the problem to the resolution. So let's look at this poem by Sir Thomas Wyatt. Whoso list to hunt, I know where is and hind. But as for me, alas, I may know more. The vain travail hath wearied me so sore, I am of them that farthest come behind. So in the opening quatrain, he sets the stage. Whoever wants to go hunting, I, I know where there's a deer. That's what the word hind means. But as for me, alas, I'm done with it. The work has made me so tired, I am further behind than anyone else. So that's the first quatrain. Yet may I by no means my wearied mind draw from the deer, but as she flee at the fore, fainting I follow. I leave off, therefore, since in a net I seek to hold the wind. So he goes on to say, even though I'm done with it, I can't get my mind off of the deer. Instead, she goes ahead, flee at the fore, and I follow, and I am fainting. I quit, then. It's like trying to catch the wind in a net. So you might be 
thinking at this point, hmm, I bet this isn't really about a deer. And you would be right. This is generally about a relationship. And I think you can see a lot of the, the conventions of Petrarchism that we talked about. He is absolutely enamored. He's pursuing, but he can't have, he can't catch. Um, and ends up fainting. Very typical of a Petrarchan kind of poem. Then we get the volta, the turn. Who list her hunt, I put him out of doubt, as well as I may spend his time in vain. Engraven with diamonds and letters plain, there is written her fair neck round about. Noli me tangere, for Caesar's I am, and wild for to hold, though I seem tame. So what he basically says is, anyone else who wants to try this hunt, get it out of your head, because you're going to be in the same spot that I am. You're not going to be able to catch her or have her. And around her neck, there's a collar. And he's using this image of the deer again. Noli me tangere, which literally means don't touch me. For Caesar's I am, and wild to hold, even though I seem tame. So here we get, if we go back to the list of Petrarchan ideas, the conflict, beautiful but desired, we get the obstacle that we see, which is, in this case, that this woman who he is madly in love with happens to belong to the king, um, Caesar. And that is what makes it impossible for him to ever obtain her. So we have this wonderful meditation on unrequited love presented to us in this elaborate metaphor of the hunt. This is one of the best examples that I can think of of the Italian sonnet in English. It captures this octave of two quatrains. We've got a clear volta, uh, a turn from the actual pursuing to the meditation on why the pursuit is entirely ineffective in the sestet. And note the rhyme scheme, A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, C, D, C, D, C, E, E. The Italian sonnet form, the sestet, there is not necessarily a regular rhyming pattern, except that it is usually three rhymes that are different from this. So that's kind of the Italian sonnet. Let's take a look at a Shakespearean sonnet, uh, the other major sonnet form in the English language. This is a poem that should be familiar to many of you, and you can see that the rhyme scheme is quite different. A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. So again, I'm going to make the font just a tad smaller. I hope this is still readable. But what you can see here, again, sonnet, 14 lines. In this case, we have what we would say three quatrains with a closing couplet. Couplet is simply a pair of lines that are rhymed. And I think you can see that the structure ends up being a little bit different. We end up with three kind of parallel quatrains, followed by a closing couplet that offers some kind of resolution or a snappy ending. This comes about for a couple of different reasons, one of the main ones being that it is far harder to create rhymes in English than it is in Italian. If you think about Italian, you know, just about every word ends with the sound E, so linguini, uh, tetrazzini, whatever. Um, those rhyme pretty nicely. English does not do that. And what Shakespeare does is to break up the need to have all of the A rhymes. So you only need two A rhymes here, whereas in the Italian sonnet you need four. So let's look at the effect that this can have. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. So he is trying to think of comparisons for his lover, comparing her to a summer's day, but she's more beautiful than that. Um, and then reflects on other natural imagery, the weather here. And you can see that this kind of carries over into the next stanza, the next quatrain. Sometimes too hot the eye of heaven shines and often is his gold complexion dimmed. And every fair from fair sometimes declines by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. So he's trying to think of a way to describe his love, um, his lover, 
and says, you know, sometimes the sun gets too hot. So comparing her to the sun doesn't work very well. Often is his gold complexion dimmed. In other words, it gets cloudy. And every fair from fair sometimes declines by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. This is a little more difficult, but the basic idea here is everything progressively ends up moving towards an ending. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So there's a little bit of a change here. Now he talks about the summer of his love and says it's not going to fade away. Um, and why is it not going to fade away? Well, we come back to these Petrarchan conventions. The power of poetry to preserve, in this case, the beauty of the lover. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this. And the this is the lines, the eternal lines. And this gives life to thee. So as long as people are reading my poems, your beauty will continue to be alive. Whereas if I had compared it to something more natural, like the weather or a flower, those things end and fade. We don't need to be too concerned about the content of the poem. What I do want to point out to you is the versatility of this sonnet form. On the one hand, you've got three quatrains that can parallel each other, but you should also notice that we can still have a similar structure to the Italian sonnet, where the third quatrain offers something just a little bit different. The first two quatrains here talk about what he shouldn't compare his love to, now we move to what he should, poetry, and the closing couplet gives the kind of snappy close. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. So a couple of takeaway points for all of this. The sonnet originates in these Petrarchan conventions. That's what its purpose is, originally. That changes over time, and I want you to look for some of the changes that you see in John Donne's poetry, but also look for the ways that he keeps these conventions. Second key point here, any time you see a poem that is 14 lines long, one of the first things you should be asking is, oh, is it possible that this is a sonnet or some variation of it? It's not like the sonnet just fades away. It's a continued form that you'll see come up over and over and over again. Third thing is to pay close attention to the form of the sonnet. An Italian sonnet by nature does something a little bit different from a Shakespearean sonnet. So as you're reading Dunn's sonnets, pay attention to the form, pay attention to the way that he uses the form, and pay attention to the way that he uses and violates the typical conventions that we see in the sonnet. Hope that helps us just a little bit more than what Wolowski gives you.